everyone. We're, we're going to get started with Grand Rounds. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Today we're having two presentations. First, we're going to hear from Rene Choi, who's one of our, our new first year residents. I think this is actually his intern presentation, though, because, he, he, because of scheduling, we ended up doing it now. So he gets two Grand Rounds this year. But he's talking about seeing is believing in retinal, regener retinal regeneration. Uh, uh, okay. Thank you, Brian, for that very kind introduction. Uh, so, well, today I'm going to be talking to all of you about a topic that I'm particularly interested in. Um, and I came across it the past couple years that I've been to Arvo, and that's on the topic of retina regeneration. And what I'm going to provide for you today is an overview of what's known in the literature regarding this field of retinal regeneration. So to begin this story, we have to first define what exactly are stem cells. They are a specialized class of cells that are not committed toward any particular cell fate. They have this limitless potential to proliferate as well as self-renew, and they also have the ability to develop or differentiate into many different cell types. Now, aside from obtaining stem cells from an embryo, there are many areas in the body, the human body, that we naturally have endogenous stem cells. Some of them include the bone marrow stem cell, corneal stem cells in the limbus to replace the epithelium, and there are also neural stem cells in the subventricular and subgranular zones. And what these serve as, these endogenous stem cells serve as, is they essentially replenish all lost cells, right, from in, in a specific organ from normal wear and tear. But to date, there are no identified endogenous stem cells in the human retina. And this is quite unfortunate because there are a number of blinding diseases affecting specifically the retina. And they impair vision by reducing the elements that allow us to process visual seeing. So some of them include retinitis pigmentosa and cone rod dystrophy, which primarily affect the, the, the photoreceptor layer. Also, you have age-related macular degeneration, which affects the RP as well as the photoreceptor layer. Diabetic retinopathy, which is known to affect, it could affect all cell types in the retina. And glaucoma, we have the ganglion cells. Now, to emphasize the gravity of this disease, or these diseases, I'd like to demonstrate to all of you how retinitis pigmentosa manifests in a patient who's afflicted with it. So here is a beautiful picture of the Tetons from Teton National Park. And all of us who are not afflicted with this, with retinitis pigmentosa, we can see this image in its entirety. However, somebody who has retinitis pigmentosa, they eventually lose their peripheral vision until they reach irreversible blindness. And to date, there's no effective treatment for retinitis pigmentosa. So I asked myself, you know, there are all these diseases where that specifically kill off specific retinal cells in the retina, right? So what if there were an endogenous stem cell source that could replenish these lost cells, as occurs, for instance, with our corneal epithelium? So to begin this journey, we've got to start with uh, the history, history of the field of regeneration and how it all started. It started in 1744 when Abraham Trembley, he's a, he was a Swiss naturalist, and he was the first to discover that the hydra was capable of regenerating different parts of its body when it was surgically resected. Now, it wasn't until 1781, Charles Binet, uh, many of you may be familiar with him because he discovered also Charles Binet syndrome, he discovered that newts had this remarkable ca capability of regenerating their eyes if a small portion of it was removed. This discovery essentially led to further investigations in lens and retinal regeneration as key experimental sy systems for the next two centuries. Now to the main part of the talk. Is there evidence essentially of retinal regeneration in the literature? And the answer is yes. And it depends on where the damage occurs. Also, it depends on the species. So it's... And if damage occurs in the central parts of the retina, 
The amphibians have this remarkable capability of regenerating the retina, and the putative stem cells are known to be the retinal pigmented epithelial cells. Now in the fish, it's been identified at the, as the molar glia. Now before we talk about this, I want to talk, cover this one area known as the ciliary marginal zone, the CMZ. So what exactly is the CMZ? It's an area that lies between the ciliary epithelium and the, and the endogenous retina, and it consists of retinal progenitor cells that are constantly cycling, and they generate new neurons throughout the life of an animal. Now this occurs in amphibians as well as fish. Okay. Now what's remarkable about the CMZ is that in amphibian models such as Xenopus lavis, the South uh, South African clawed frog, as well as newts, the multiple uh, groups have found that once you damage the retina, and it could be many different da damage paradigms, it can either be from mechanical damage, from a retinectomy, or even neurotoxic damage, right? The CMZ can respond by increasing its rate of proliferation of cells. What's even more remarkable <laughs> about the CMZ is that if you ablate a specific type of cell in the retina, for instance, if you ablate an amacrine cell, the CMZ has a feedback mechanism where it increases the selective production of that cell type. It's actually quite remarkable. Now, what about CMZ in mammals, or more importantly, humans? Unfortunately, this does not exist. Okay. Now, the limitation with of the CMZ is that it proliferates, you know, and it generates new retinal progenitor cells for regeneration only in the peripheral areas in the retina. They don't have the ability to migrate into the central areas of the retina if they're damaged. So now I'm going to cover about the central areas of the retina. What are the primary cell type? What's the primary cell type that gives rise to these new neurons? Well, let's first cover amphibians. In amphibians, it's been identified as a retinal pigmented epithelium. So, so let's talk a little bit about the retinal pigmented epithelium, epithelium. So this is a specialized group of epithelial cells that sits above the photoreceptor layer. And they're involved in many different maintenance tasks for the retina. Some of them include absorbing light to pr protect the, light, uh, the photoreceptors recycling photopigment that's part of the phototransduction cascade, as well as phagocytosing the outer segments of the photoreceptors. Now various groups across the country as well as internationally have identified amphibians and two different species of or uh, subsects of uh, amphibians, the anurin amphibians as well as the uridyl amphibians. They have this ability where you perform a retinectomy, so that's mechanical damage. When you physically scoop out the retina, you give these animals ample time to recover, they're able to reestablish the retina almost as if nothing ever took place. It's, it's quite fascinating. So what does this process entail? It's known as a process called retinal pigment to epithelial transdifferentiation. And it's broken up into two different steps. The first step is that the cells need to dedifferentiate into an earlier precursor cell. So what they do is they re-enter the cell cycle, they begin to lose their pigment, and then they start to express retinal progenitor specific genes. Okay. After that, the second step they begin to redifferentiate into all the different cell types within the retina. Now, up until now, we've been talking about mechanical forms of injury, at least in the amphibian. So, we look in the literature, if you look in the literature, there's actually evidence of disease models showing that they can actually re, um, they could regenerate lost retinal cell types. So, here's one particular paper where they develop a transgenic line of, uh, of retinitis pigmentosa in frogs. They were able to specifically ablate all the rod photoreceptors. And then after doing so, so this, this picture right here, they got rid of all the rod photoreceptors. They gave the frogs 30 days to recover. And what they were able to determine was that 
there's these transducin labeled cells, which transducin is a specific marker to rod foot receptors, and they're also labeled with EDU. And EDU is a marker for cells that are newly generated. Basically, they, they re enter the cell cycle, thus suggesting that these are brand new, newly generated cells. Now, what about the molar glia? The molar glia have been identified as the stem cells in zebrafish, as well as potentially mice. However, there's only circumstantial evidence showing that it occurs in mice, and we'll cover that in a second. So I want to know in the field, how exactly did they, did they determine that the molar glial cells were the stem cells, giving rise to new neurons after damage? It was, they figured it out, it was a brilliant experiment done by Pamela Raymond's group from the University of Michigan. What she did was that she developed a transgenic fish line where she had the GFAP promoter, which is a molar glial specific promoter driving green fluorescent protein. A green f so essentially what that means is that every molar glial cell is labeled with green fluorescent protein. She essentially did a, a, a linear tracing uh, study here. Then she photoablated all the cone and rod foot receptors and found that over time, right, there are new rod and cone foot receptors that were labeled with GFP. So if you see here, here's GFP, here's rho 4 d 2 which is a marker specific for rod foot receptors, and here's BRDU, which is a, uh, it's basically a marker for new cells that are generated, and they're all co-localized. And you also have here cone photoreceptors. This is a ZPR1. It's a marker specific for cones, co-labeled co with GFP. Now, how about mammals? Evidence in the literature is very, it's very s limited. So it's, but there's this one paper that was published by Tom Ray's group from the University of Washington. And what they determined was after neurotoxic damage, they specifically used the neurotoxin NMDA, which kills amacrine cells as well as retinal ganglion cells. What they found out was that there's a very limited proliferative response of the molar glial cells after injury. However, this response can be increased with exogenous factors administered such as FGF, fibroblast growth factor, and epidermal growth factor. Dedifferentiation also took place when they administered these exogenous growth factors. However, these newly quote unquote stem cells had a limited differentiation profile, meaning that they're only able to differentiate into amacrine cells. They didn't develop into any other cell type. But the real question is whether or not the molar glial cells really are the stem cells for the mouse retina. And that question hasn't been answered yet because they still they didn't do a lineage tracing study like Pamela Raymond's group did in the zebrafish. Now before I get to the last section of my talk, I just want to cover briefly stem cell transplantation. So there are a number of groups trying to develop stem cell transplantation techniques for to heal or essentially as a form of treatment for blinding diseases affecting the retina. And obviously they do this because we lack this regenerative response. There's a seminal paper published by McLaren and colleagues out at the University of College in London where they're able to take rod precursor cells, transplant them into the subretinal space of various retinized pigmentosa models in mouse. And these, these precursor cells were able to fully differentiate into rod foot receptors as well as functionally in integrate into the rest of the retina. And they were able to determine that they functionally integrated by doing light evoked uh, multi-field potentials as well as with uh, pupillary or gauging pupillary responses. Now this is all very exciting. At this point of the literature search, I, I thought it was very exciting the fact that people are trying to uncover the mechanisms that govern regeneration, but also some different groups are trying to come up with different stem cell transplantation techniques for these blinding retinal diseases. However, I was thinking if we were to take this approach and translate it to the clinic, what are some potential limitations? Now, one of the major limitations 
is this concept of retinal remodeling. And many of you may be familiar with this because this has all been characterized by Robert E. Mark from our very, uh, our very own Moran Eye Center. So what, what Dr. Mark and his, uh, and his group di uh, discovered was that in various animal models of retinal degeneration, after deafferentation of the rest of the retina uh, from the photoreceptors, there's this massive reorganization of the retina that occurs. Okay. And it's characterized, or it's uh, broken up into sequential phases. The first phase is characterized by rod photoreceptor death, cone outer segment loss, the molar glial cells begin to hypertrophy, undergo the gliotic process, as well as bipolar cell dendrite retraction. The second phase is characterized by the death of cone photoreceptors and the molar glial field actually forms. And that's when the molar glial cells extend their processes out into the subretinal space and they entomb any cells that are in the outer nuclear layer. The third phase is broken up into two subphases. The first subphase, uh, characterized by new microneuroma formation. That's when these neurofibrillary uh, tangles form from various processes, from processes from various cells, such as bipolar cells, ganglion cells, as well as amacrine cells. Lastly, late, the late stage three, there's, a, um, there's death of all cell types within the retina, as well as cell translocation. So you'll see an amacrine cell translocate to the outer nuclear layer where they don't belong, or you'll have a surviving rod photoreceptor in the inner nuclear layer. So I asked myself, there's this, if, there's this m if there's this massive rewiring of the retina that's going on, it may not be you know, the best idea to just reactivate these mechanisms that govern regeneration or take a stem, stem cell transplantation approach in order to replenish lost cells because how do we know the rest of the retina is still intact? in order to process information the same way that you and I would be able to if we don't, if, if, uh, because we don't have these diseases. So if I were to take a clinical approach <coughs> using stem cell transplantation or activating these regenerative mechanisms, I would first take a two-step approach. This is actually the part that the stem cell field is kind of <laughs> somewhat ignoring, most likely because, you know, they, they're trying to get their grants funded. But Really, <laughs> what happens is that I think we, we first have to at least, you know, it, it doesn't matter what the disease is that's affecting the retina, we have to first focus on elucidating the mechanism that governs the disease. Because only then can we identify specific steps to intervene on to halt the progression of the disease, prevent modeling of the retina, and then hopefully then we could focus on activating these regenerative mechanisms as well as using stem cell transplantation to one day allow somebody with retinitis pigmentosa to be able to see this image in its entirety. On that note, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to my talk, and it's an honor to be here at the Moran. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Dr. Olson.
we always have to be careful about the public face of the grant and the way the press will be taken. So there are two ways to not just grants but trying to raise money for the press in these ways. I am as a cabinet, I'm going to investigate a little bit more. I've been invited to one of the ACC entities, one of the countries that's really pushing this. We're having a presentation, we're treating this as private space. And what I heard you know, the big names are fighting on. starting to find on to the same side. But to me, this falls a short of side. And I don't know where, we're, we're talking about some publication that's just came out. And so I'm not even sure which journal it's going to be. I feel like, yeah, I agree with everything Dr. Bernstein said. I think that if one were to take the stem cell transplantation approach to heal you know, retinal diseases, I think it's, it's in its infancy. The field is in its infancy. And the reason why is because if you look at the literature, Everybody is just using it as a, it's almost a crude form of engineering. They're just shoving cells into the subretinal space or the intravitreal space and hoping to God that they differentiate, functionally integrate, structurally integrate. But really, we have to focus first on understanding all the different developmental steps, right, of stem cell development, but also differentiation. And that hasn't been mapped out yet. I think we have to understand that before we start throwing cells into an in vivo, you know, animal model. And, and they're doing it because <coughs> the brain has a very advanced disease because of the level of the study where we know that there's substantial uh, retinal uh, disease violation also in the people we talked about. So, I mean, it's, that they're just, all of those that you provided, no, there is a lot of hype going on out there and there's, I think, a lot of questions from patients about why this is being done and very few patients obviously respond to it, but they're discovering a few of them. We have to first remember most of these are phase one studies because they are for phase two, not for application two. But there is a strong strong tendency that phase one studies might be used for prosecution and we hope that the head of that NEI are going to pick a phase one study. If you can pick out and pick and choose patients that do a little bit better with a lot of motivation, we are undergoing right this big stem cell transplant and we see this big media presence that you're getting your cells from privacy better to be a little more functional. Right. Again, to them, does that stop the transfer number for uh, on the phase one? Well, that, I think that we do the same number two. I think we do that. Yeah, two, and then, and then when the, the quantity of folks that are, are just asking you to, to approve. Right. And that was, and I, of course, here when Paul Friedman was here, I think he came out and started talking over the land. He announced the phase one results, and we just talked about how great it was. And you should know that if you still have any eyes. Dr. Warner. Just one thing I want to add, though, is that um, uh, I think that it is very tempting for advocates to want to invite everybody to be part of this. But the active partners that are in the study can help you also understand the process as well. So um, in, in the, the prosecution of stem cell development, we have to understand what happens in the first stem cell You're absolutely right about that because there have been some great developments from stem cell transplantation research. For instance, after taking stem cells transplanted to the retina, they, they found that it could 
somehow, for some reason, it actually prevents the progression of retinitis pigmentosa. And they've, actually, they've identified it with BDNF. I think this was a group out in Bascom Palmer. And now they're try trying to use, find some way to administer uh, BDNF into retina for with, uh, afflicted with retinitis pigmentosa. Brian. Could you explain, could you comment a little bit on the visual function in the, you talked about the MKB model, so there's an area that moves in with the retina. Mm -hmm. It looks like maybe there's a dystonical function, but maybe it might not be absorbed into the BT cells. Yet. Very good, yeah, that's a very good, uh, that's a very good question. So in amphibians, as well as in fish, they've determined in fish, I believe they performed ERGs after regeneration after photoablation of the cone and rod photoreceptors, and then after they regenerated, and they found that they were able to fully function uh, just based on the electrophysiologic data. In amphibians, there's one group that used a behavioral, a visually mehe mediated uh, behavioral assay, where half the, um, half the tank is white, half the tank is black. Usually, they like to stay on the white side of the tank, but after ablation of all the rod photoreceptors, that's scotopic <coughs> vision, 50% of the time they're on the white, 50% of the time they're on the black. Give them ample time to regenerate, they all swim back to the white side. So, and that's all I know. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.